Today, we are going to talk hormones. And we're going to go through the myths and misconceptions that are out there because this concerns me. I think even among a lot of doctors, there's a lot of misunderstanding about bioidentical hormone replacement. So I think it's important to listen to this whole thing because we're going to talk about a lot of things about hormones that might be novel to some of you. We recently posted a Facebook quiz just asked about hormones and there were certainly some wrong answers there. So it made me realize that we're not getting all of our messages across to patients. So first thing, I'm just briefly going to go on this one because I think it's covered so much by most functional medicine doctors. And that's hormones absolutely do not cause cancer. The data, even from the Women's Health Initiative, which pulled hormones off everybody, was that estrogen actually lowered the risk, estradiol lowered the risk of cancer. It was only the progestins, when they were added in, that the cancer risk went up. But if you picked apart that study, the women who were on estradiol alone actually had a lower incidence of both breast and uterine cancer. It was only the Premarin artificial progestins that were linked to cancer. If you have active cancer, and it's a hormone receptive positive cancer, probably you should not be on hormones at that time. Now, might you be able to use them down the road? Yes. But during that time, if there's a hormone positive cancer, we don't want to feed into it. They absolutely do not cause the cancer. Cancer began many years ago from a whole lot of other reasons, including metabolic stress, abnormal homeostasis of the hormones, abnormal metabolism of the hormones, abnormal methylation or detoxification of the hormones. So, so many pieces that go into it that we need to look at in people, especially people who have had cancer. I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I know you guys hear this a lot, but please get out of your head. You'll still continue to hear it from the regular physicians I know, and we just have to keep debunking that myth. The second thing is really important because I hear this even from the functional medicine doctors. You have to get bioidentical hormones from a compounding pharmacy. There is definitely bioidentical hormones that are available at your regular pharmacy made by pharmaceutical companies and they work just fine. Estradiol is estradiol is estradiol. Now, Premarin is not estradiol. It is a horse urine. Estradiol, whether I get it from my compounding pharmacy or I get it from my traditional regular pharmacy as a patch or a gel, it is the same medication. Progesterone, the same thing. Prometrium, from my regular old pharmacy is the same as my compound of progesterone. And I hear that all the time, even from physicians telling people you have to get bioidentical hormones from a compounding pharmacy. That is absolutely untrue. Now, why are compounding pharmacies sometimes a better place to go is because I can really dose adjust, optimize for a specific patient at a dose or form that I want. The other thing is when I look at things like progesterone, if I get it from a regular pharmaceutical, most of them are in a peanut oil, which might not be great for all of my patients. And a lot of them have a coloring in them. So that might be not great either. It's a little bit more pure for me to get it compounded. But if it's less expensive, it's still a great way to get progesterone, whether you get it from the pharmacy or the compounding pharmacy. You're going to hear this a lot. I hear from my patients. I give them a script for estradiol gel. And they're like, wait, I want bioidentical. This is bioidentical. So it's really finding the form that works for you. The next thing I want to point out is that there is a lot of different ways to get estrogens and progesterones. You can use progesterone orally. You can use it topically. You could use it vaginally. They all have a little bit different effects. Progesterone given orally has a little bit more brain anti-anxiety effects. So a lot of physicians like that. But if we just want the uterine effects, we can certainly use it vaginally. Topically, it's not great. It might be at least somewhat helpful in my patients who just can't tolerate other forms of it. Typically, the best way, I think, is oral allopregnolone derivatives, which is going to be sort of calming, anti-anxiety, help with sleep, help with inflammation. Now, estrogens can be done as injections. They can be done as transdermal. So they can be done as patches. They can be done orally. My preference, so it's not everybody's, is to use it as a transdermal. If we give oral estrogens, they do somewhat, a slight, increase blood clotting risk. So I like transdermals, but there are people who are really preferential. Your doctor may love oral estrogens if they can give you a good reason why they want that in you, that I think it's a fine way to do it. It's just you have to be a little bit more aware that there are more risks associated particularly with blood clots. Now, if you have a patient who just does not absorb transdermals, well, you can use an injectable estrogen as well twice a week injectable estrogen, just like we do with testosterone for men and sometimes women as well. If you can't take it, vaginal estriol 
or topical on your face for skin is another way. One of my friends, Dr. Amy Killen, always says every vagina needs estrogen, so you can do just a vaginal estriol, which is not going to get systemic and not going to have bad effects. At least getting some vaginal estrogen is going to be important if the other forms are contraindicated in you. So you have to work with a provider who really knows what they're doing, who can understand what they're doing, who can watch the metabolism of these hormones. It's all really important to do. It's not that one way is wrong, one way is right. There's a lot of different methods. We all have our preferences. I tend to be one who errs to the side of safety more than anything else. And so that's why I use a transdermal. But it doesn't mean there's not other forms that are going to work for people. The next thing I really want to talk about is progesterone itself. I hear a lot of women who are not on progesterone. And the reason being, they don't have a uterus. The old school ob population, the key was that progesterone stabilized the uterine lining, and that was the importance of it, so you didn't get hyperproliferation of the endometrial lining and get cancer. The problem is that progesterone goes way beyond that. There are progesterone receptors everywhere on your immune cells. They help with bone. They help with muscle, brain, cognitive function cardiac function. They're really important immune modulators, anti-inflammatories. Even if I don't have a uterus, I absolutely need progesterone. So we need to get that out of our head that progesterone is just for the uterus. It is not. The first thing that happens when progesterone levels drop in both men and women is that we start getting achy joints because joints have progesterone receptors as well. And it's one of the things that are responsible for lubrication of our joints. So I will use a lot of my men who have low progesterone because progesterone is important in men as well. It's a forgotten hormone in men, but it's important for prostate protection in men. So little low dose progesterone in men can be super useful too. And it gets really forgotten. Everybody who's on estrogen should be on progesterone. And progesterone oftentimes should be used much earlier than estrogen because progesterone levels will start to drop very young. And we may need to cycle progesterone in through their period to make sure that they have enough progesterone on board all the time. Next myth, if you don't start hormones early, they're not worth it. If you start hormones at the time that they start dropping, we have more protection for cardiovascular health, brain health, for bone health. So earlier is better. There is never too late to start. The cardiovascular protection is still there. It's not as robust as if I start it early. So it's important to be following these even at young ages so we know when that drop occurs and we can intervene. But it's never too late to start hormones. They are still critical for brain health. They are still critical for bone health. And they're still helpful for cardiac health, even if you're 70 or 80. We see a lot of this, where doctors are treating symptoms caused by hormone replacement with a drug and thinking they're treating the hormone problem. For instance, the drug Viosa, which is to treat hot flashes. Well, hot flashes are vasomotor dysfunctions because of low estrogen. And they're actually a sign of endothelial dysfunction, that your cardiovascular system is in disarray, that your blood vessels are not working well because of low estrogen. If I use a drug that's just changing my brain to tell me to temperature regulate differently, it's not fixing the problem, which is the vascular dysfunction that's occurred because of the low estrogen. Treating symptoms instead of treating the cause, which is the low hormone levels, is problematic. You absolutely can't do that or using an antidepressant because my patient is anxious or depressed and saying, oh, I've cured the problem, the depression is better. That depression, because of low progesterone, low hormones, low testosterone, is creating a lot of other issues in the brain. Depression is a neuroinflammatory disease. I can use serotonin uptake inhibitors, drugs to help that. It's not really reducing the neuroinflammation because of the lack of hormones. Treat the hormone loss with hormones. Don't treat these symptoms Those are probably the main things I want to get across because those are the main misconceptions. First and foremost, they do not cause cancer. Number two, you can get perfectly good hormones from a regular pharmacy, but there's reasons why you might want to use a compounding pharmacy. We need to make sure all the hormones are balanced. We need to be following that carefully. All men, all women need all the hormones. So progesterone levels should be checked in men as well. Testosterone levels should be checked in women as well. Every vagina needs estrogen. All of us need all three hormones, and they decline in all of us as we age. So they need to be followed. The earlier you can start following them, the better, because as they start dropping, we want to catch things then. And then lastly, work with your physician to find the right form for you, what's going to be most cost-effective, most beneficial, most tolerable for you. That's all really important because there's just not one size fits all. There's not a perfect protocol to this. So hopefully you'll 
take that to heart. You'll share it. If this was useful information, please give it a thumbs up. Please follow us on YouTube and on our Instagram at Dr. Yurth at Border Longevity Institute. And we will see you in the future.